Great. Again, happy Sabbath and um, welcome to our visitors. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord. I was not supposed to speak this week. We had a guest to speak, was supposed to be speaking, and they realized that there was a conflict. So uh, we will continue where we were last week or where we finished off last week. Um, I tried to, and I've been trying to build this case to help us to have our spiritual discerning work uh, so that we can see the things that are happening a lot clearer. Uh, the objective, brothers and sisters, is that events are happening that are important, and events are happening that are distractions. And when we left off last week, um, we talked about knowing the difference between present truth and pleasant truth. And we are going to pick up from there so we can really see how we could be very easily drawn into um, following after rabbits. Let's have a word of prayer so we can move on very quickly. Father in heaven, I ask that you will remove me out of the way. Let me decrease that Christ may increase and that all things that are said today will be ordered by your word. Bless us and keep us. Lord, this is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We spoke, when we spoke last week, we were in, we, we, we started building our case last week um, in terms of identifying that in the Old Testament there is spoken of a national Sunday law. So let's go back to there as we build the case because my objective is to create a sense of urgency and to also create a sense of mental acuity. So we're watching. So we're really watching the right things. I mean, there are more and more books being written by Seventh-day Adventists about COVID-19 than you can shake a stick at. And the question is, well, are you going to write a book when the next virus comes up? You know, there was a time when everybody talked about Al-Qaeda, and then you have all the different groups. And, and before you know it, you're just chasing after things, and you're getting away from what Christ said. Christ said there would be pestilences, plural. He said wars, not war. He said famines, not famine. And so if we get into the habit of always wanting to look at what everyone else is saying and doing and what's in the news, we could find ourselves ch chasing what the world is doing and getting away from what God would have us to do. And so what is happening right now is that the behind the scenes things are happening. And as we built the case last week, speaking of the throne of the throne of Satan or the throne of iniquity, Psalms 94 is where I'll ask you to start, Psalms 94. And we talked about the throne of iniquity because if we think about iniquity, then we have to also think about who is the author of iniquity. And you know that the author of iniquity is Satan. And we also talked last week, that old, that old serpent, the dragon, all the things that we see in Revelations describing or defining who Satan is. Revelation, excuse me, Psalms 94, Psalms 94, 20 and 21, Psalms 94, 20 and 21. And so we want to make sure that we understand how this was talked about in the Old Testament, how it's being manifested in these days, and how we can make sure that we are not caught up in what would ultimately be the image to the beast and the mark of the beast. The Bible tells us in Psalms 94, beginning at verse 20, shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law. Verse 20 says, shall the throne of iniquity, or shall Satan's throne, have fellowship with you, people of God? Will you con congregate around Satan's throne? Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? And then around Satan's throne, those who will gather, they will frameth or make mischief by a law. And when we talked last week, we connected and showed that law, this law in terms of a national Sunday law. So will the people of God be tricked into congregating around Satan's throne through a law? Verse 21 says, they gather themselves together against the soul of the, soul of the righteous. That would be those who would be keeping the law 
in an effort to and condemn the innocent blood. And so our objective is to make sure that anything that smells of, anything that looks like it has something to do with Satan or those who are working for Satan, the people of God have to stay away from. They have to go 100 degrees, 180 degrees the opposite direction. Do you believe that? Amen. Okay. So when we look at the dragon, we talked about it last week. When we looked at the dragon, um, we go to Revelation 13 and 1. Revelation 13 and 1. Because we have to be careful. See, the dragon, that old serpent, Satan, he is not going to show himself to us until it's too late. But he is going to use his agents. He used his agent, the serpent, <clears throat> the serpent in the Garden of Eden. He, even though Adam and Eve had been told to look out for him, they didn't know that he was going to use a medium. And so most people, because they haven't seen Satan come in a blue, I mean, red outfit with horns, they think he's, he doesn't exist. But he does exist. The Bible tells us in Revelation 13 and 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And so this beast that is introduced in Revelation 13, 1 and 2, and that career of that beast actually goes all the way to Revelation 13 and 10. It's working behind the scene after that. But this particular beast gets its power, gets its seat, gets its great authority from who? The dragon. The dragon. And the dragon is? Satan. Satan. Amen? Amen? And so we need to make sure that we know who the beast is. Now, we know who the beast is, right? Yes. Are you sure? Okay, Sister, Sister Jessie says it's the papacy. If someone were to come to you and ask you, how do you know that the beast is the papacy, how would you prove that to them? There you go. Sister Connie says Daniel 7. Do you want to elaborate on that, Sister Connie? You want me to go ahead? Okay, I'll elaborate. Daniel 7 introduces what? Four beasts, right? And then it tells us in Daniel 7, 17 that these four beasts are four kings, right? Okay, and then we go a little further in 7, 23, and it tells us a, king, a kingdom. So we know that this beast that is introduced in Revelation 13, 1 and 2 is a king or a kingdom, Okay. Does that make sense? And so the Bible tells us out of the mouth of two or more witnesses. We have two lines of scripture that tell us that a beast is a king. Two lines in Daniel that tell us that a beast is a king. So a beast is a king. Those four beasts that we see in Revelation, excuse me, in Daniel 7, that Daniel had a vision of, are the four kingdoms that from the time of the Jewish captivity, uh, which was in, which went, went from, um, five, excuse me, went from 606 B.C. all the way, it's supposed to go all the way, those four kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, those four beasts are four kingdoms. We should be very, very clear to that, on, on that. And so this beast, this final beast, which is depicted in Revelation 13, is the fourth kingdom. Are there five kingdoms? No. Are you sure? Amen. There, there's the fifth kingdom, but I should have, I can see, I, maybe that was a trick question, and I didn't intend it to be. Are there four earthly kings, five earthly kingdoms? No. Right. Amen. So we have four kingdoms, and what kingdom are we in right now? The We're in the fourth kingdom, and that fourth kingdom is a very, that, that fourth kingdom variates. It starts as the, feet, the legs of iron, and then it transforms into the feet of iron and clay. Right? But that's still the same beast, though, right? Okay, great. Now, again, this is my premise. This is what I'm trying to do. The prophet says in Testimonies to the Churches, Volume 6, she says, Brethren and sisters, I would that I might say something to awaken you to the importance of this time. That is my task today. I'm trying to say something 
that would awaken you to the importance of this time. The significance of the events that are now taking place. I point you to the aggressive movements now being made for the restriction of religious liberty. And many of us are probably thinking to ourselves, well, I'm not hearing anything about that. I'm not really seeing anything that's super clear that's saying religious liberty is being restricted. We are going to see in a few moments that the moves that are happening are to restrict your religious liberty. See, when, when Lucifer, excuse me, or when Satan asked God or told God he was going to and fro, when in the book of Job, the Lord allowed Satan to attack Job. As quickly as God said you can, you can do it, that's how quickly Satan went after Job, right? That shows you that as soon as God withdraws his protection, Satan goes just that quickly, right? But right now we're in a time, and those four angels of Revelation 17 are holding back the winds, but small drops, small drops are, are being allowed to come through. That's why we have things like COVID-19. That's why we're seeing things like droughts. That's why we're seeing things like locusts, because small drops of God's wrath are being allowed to happen upon the earth. If God were to completely release, we wouldn't, nobody would, there would be no flesh left. And so this, this, these particular movements for religious liberty or restriction of religious liberty are happening. We just don't, we just don't hear it as clearly as the rest of the world. We hear it, I mean, as, as we should. The rest of the world hears it one way, but we as the people of God should be able to see it and know it. But we don't see it because we think, oh, it's, it's still out there. We haven't heard about it yet. But it is, it's right there, and I'm going to show it to you. God's sanctified memorial has been torn down, the Sabbath. And in its place, a false Sabbath, bearing no sanctity, stands before the world. And while the powers of darkness are staring up the elements from beneath. The Lord God in heaven is sending power from above to meet the emergency by arousing his living agencies to exalt the law of heaven. Sister White says it's an emergency. We're living in an emergency, and if it were not for God restricting or holding back the winds of strife, all hell would break loose. And so as we looked last week, we saw that, and not just, just to tie it to Revelation 13, 1 and 2, we see the dragon and we see the beast, and the dragon gives his power to the beast, and then we see another beast come on the scene, originally really in 1776 or sometime before then, and that beast being the one that came up as a lamb but eventually spake as a dragon, and that, set, and that first beast, that first beast, not long after the, first, the second beast comes up, that second beast, just a few years later, in 1798, received the deadly wound. And so as that beast starts to, has to go into the wilderness, this beast right here comes out. This is, this is the beast that comes out, or this is, the, this rep is representation of the Protestant churches in America. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. And so, but not long afterwards, but not long afterwards, this beast starts speaking as a dragon. It wasn't a long time before this. Really, brothers and sisters, when the United States came on the scene in 1776, it was a short time afterwards that she started speaking like a dragon. Um, when, we had, when we had our class Wednesday night, we saw that very shortly after the United States rose up on the scene, it started to espouse imperialistic type of principles going after and trying to attack and take other countries, trying to stake its flag in other countries. And so it wasn't very long that the United States, because of its desire to be like the other nations, started to speak as a dragon. So it came on the scene as a lamb, it rose up, and then next thing we know, it, was, it became an apostate church controlling an apostate nation because God set this nation up so it could be the breadbasket, it could be the place where the rest of the world would want to come. And not long after that, we start seeing the power that the first beast had started to be manifested 
and the second beast in the form of an image. Am I making sense thus far? Yes. The things that the first beast was doing, because it got the deadly wound, it couldn't do it out in the open anymore, so it was now doing it through the second beast. We okay with that? Okay, now let's look at our opening text. Let's look at our opening text. Revelation 14, 9 through 12. Revelation 14, 9 through 12. We there? We're close to there. Are we there? Amen. I heard one or two amens. The Bible says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of, of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark in his, of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The third angel's message, the third, this is the third angel's message. We all know that. Very few people know that except Seventh-day Adventists. And I would venture to say that many Seventh-day Adventists don't know that nowadays. But very few people, very few Christians know this as the three, the three angel's messages or this as the third angel's message like the Seventh-day Adventist church knows this third angel's message is subsequently given this third angel's message is subsequently given in response to the fact that the fallen apostate protestant churches refused to come out of mysterious babylon and this message this third angel's message was given in 1847 so this message was a response because the first angel's message was ignored and then the second angel's message was ignored. And when God sends a message, when God sends truth, when God sends something to the rest of the world, when God sends something because we are told that the rejection of the truth, if, God, if you reject the Holy Spirit who brings you the truth, what else has God to give you but what? strong delusions and so as a result of the rejection of the first and second angels messages the third angels message is given but those apostate or fallen apostate churches not the individuals but the fallen apostate churches now enter into the process of forming the image they rejected the first and second angels message and now they are doing the very same things that the first beast of Revelation 13 doing. So they basically have become an image to the first beast. Am I making sense so far? Because we need to really understand this. See, the two previous angels were given as an attempt to call the fallen apostate Protestant churches away from the beast, which is the Roman Catholic Church. But as they refused the papal dogmas, Satan was able to pull them further and further into his clutches. Let's see what the prophet says about that. She says, I saw that God was in the proclamation of the time in 1843. It was his design to arouse the people and bring them to a testing point where they should decide for or against the truth. For or against the truth. Why would she write that they, the apostate churches, should decide for or against the truth? Because they had veered away so far from the Reformation, which had actually raised them up. And they were now once again, these Protestant churches were now once again following the errors of the papacy. So she says that God had, uh, was bringing them to a testing point where they should decide for or against the truth. The three angels' messages, or the first and second angels' messages, were the truth, and they had to decide if they were going to stay in error or go to the truth. Ministers were convinced of the correctness of the positions taken on the prophetic periods. 
And some renounced their pride and left their salaries and their churches to go forth from place to place to give the message. But as the message from heaven could find a place in the hearts of but few of the professed ministers of Christ, the work was laid upon many who were not preachers. Some left their fields to sound the message while many, while others were called from their shops and their merchandise. And even some professional men were compelled to leave their professions to engage in the unpopular work of giving the first, she didn't say three, she says first, angels' messages. So at that point, God used non-preachers to join the ranks of those giving the messages. Let us remember that this was in 1843, one year, just one year before the second angel's message. Did Jesus come in 1843? Did anything happen in heaven in 1843? No, nothing happened in heaven that had an effect on us in 1843. But what was God doing in 1843? Come on, what was God doing in 1843? It tells us right there. He was testing. I saw that God was in the proclamation of the, of the time in 1843, right? It was his design to arouse the people and bring them to a testing point. In other words, God gave them the prophecy. He gave them the, the, the first angel's message and wanted to see who was going to hold on to the message. Let's see. Let's see if what I'm saying is true. Did you get where that quote comes from? It comes from Early Writings, page 232. This next quote comes from Early Writings, page 236. She says, those faithful... Now remember, the question was, did Jesus come in 1843? No. So if he didn't come, they were disappointed. Sister White says, those faithful disappointed ones who could not understand why their Lord did not come were not left in darkness. Again, they were led to their Bibles to search the prophetic periods. They didn't blame God. They said, let's go to our Bibles and see if we made a mistake. The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures and the mistake was explained. They saw that the prophetic periods reached to 1844 and that the same evidence which they had presented to show that the prophetic periods closed in 1843 proved that they would terminate in 1844. Now, in 1843, people were expecting Jesus to come. That was the first of two disappointments, correct? Was that the first of two disappointments? I'll say it again. Okay, so that was the first of two disappointments, correct? Because the second disappointment happened in 1844. The second disappointment, which was called the Great Disappointment, happened in 1844. What, Jesus, what God was doing was he was proving his people to see who really was there for the work and by faith and who was there for the fishes and the loaves, right? Right from the word of God shown upon their position. And they discovered a what? Tarrying time, a waiting time. Though it, the vision tarry, wait for it. In their love for Christ's immediate coming, they had overlooked the tarrying of the vision, which was calculated to manifest the true waiting ones. It was there to, to, to identify who really was waiting for Christ to come. Again, they had a point of time. Yes, I saw that many of them could not rise above their severe disappointment to possess that degree of zeal and energy which had marked their faith in 1843. So some of them, because of the disappointment, they couldn't rise to the occasion. But God still allowed those who wanted to, to move forward. Now here's the thing. The Bible tells us those who continue to follow by faith. Where do we find out about those? Where do we see in Scripture those who continued in 1843 to follow Jesus by faith. We've studied this before. Where do we find those people that followed Jesus by faith in 1843? Come on. Sister Connie, I know you know this. Where do we find the people who continued to follow Jesus by faith? I, verse 12 of what, Sister Lorna? You said 12. 
You said 12, but it's not Revelation. Turn with me to Daniel 12 and 12. <laughs> Daniel 12 and 12. Watch this. We all know this. We've gone over this because we need to understand that part of the, there was a group of people who decided that I'm going to follow Jesus by faith. And the Bible tells us in Daniel 12, 12, it says, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and fifty, excuse me, in five and thirty days. One thousand three hundred. Just the county's over there shaking her head. Yes. The one thousand three hundred and thirty-five years. Blessed is he that waiteth and come to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. So how do we get that? How do we figure out what that date is? How do we figure where we get the 1335? Well, we've done this before. We take 508, Daniel 11, 31, Clovis, right? 508, we add 508 to 1335, and that comes to 1843. We're the people who stuck with the Lord after 1843 blessed. Y'all hesitate. <laughs> And so here, here they saw themselves in prophecy later down the road that they were to receive a blessing. But what God was also showing, not just to them, but to the unfallen beings, that there would be a group of people for God. The prophet tells us in early writings, 260, all this you can find in the first, second, and third angel's message of early writings. She says, all heaven watched with the deepest interest, the reception of the first angel's message. Who's going to receive it? But many who profess to love Jesus and who shed tears as they read the history of the cross derided the good news of his coming. Instead of receiving the message with gladness, they declared it to be a delusion. They hated those who loved his appearing and shut them out of the churches. Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. See, you, you send truth. If you can't receive truth in the first angel's message, you're not going to be benefited from the second. Thus, you, you're, calling everyone, you're saying everyone else is delusional, but, at the, but in reality, they were the ones who were delusional. Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second, neither were they benefit by, benefited by the midnight cry, which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith where? Into the most holy place. Remember we have talked about that over and over and over again that there were two groups. There was one group collected all together at one time but Jesus says follow me by faith into the most holy place and they bowed and they, were, and they were following him by faith. They followed him but the other group did not. And so she says they could not be benefited by the midnight cry which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And by rejecting the two former messages, they had so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel's message, which shows the way into the most holy place. And so this group of people, no matter how hard they try, as long as they are, have rejected the first and second angel's message, will never, ever be able to see the Sabbath. Never be able to. They're stuck in the holy place, as we've gone over before and before, over and over again. She continues, she says, I saw that as the, as the Jews crucified Jesus, so the nominal churches, who are the nominal churches? They are daughters of the harlot, right? That would be the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, Church of Christ. All those churches are considered nominal churches. And they had crucified these messages, especially the first and second as they came, and therefore they have no knowledge of the way into the most holy. And they cannot be benefited by the intercession of Jesus there. Now, let's be clear. Let's be very clear. She's talking about the churches, not the individuals. Just like we are told in Daniel that every kingdom was removed, they had their dominion taken from them, but the people were still allowed to come. And just like when Stephen was stoned, probation closed for the nation of Israel, but it did not close for the individual people. Amen? Amen. Okay, so when we talk here about the nominal churches, we're talking about the hierarchy of those churches, not the individual people in those churches. 
Like the Jews who offered their useless sacrifices, they offer up their useless prayers to the apartment which Jesus has left. Mercy. And Satan, pleased with the deception, assumes a religious character. And leaves, remember, shall the throne of iniquity? Shall the throne of iniquity? So he assumes a religious character and leaves the mind. So God is warning us in Psalms, don't, don't do this. Don't follow them. Leads the minds of these professed Christians to himself, working with his power, his signs, and lying wonders to fasten them in his snare. Some he deceives in one way and some in another. He has different delusions prepared to affect different minds. Some look with horror upon one deception while they readily receive another. Satan deceives some with spiritualism. He also comes as an angel of light and spreads his influence over the land by means of false reformations. The churches are elated and consider that God is working marvelously for them. They think it's God working for them because they have a church that's in a mega center, in a coliseum. They think that because there are 30, 40, 50,000 people here, God must be with us. Gideon had, had 32,000 men with him. God said, that's too many. He dropped it down to 300. God says, I don't need numbers. He's looking for the hearts. I'll go back to the churches are elated and considered that God is working marvelously for them when it is the work of another spirit. The excitement will die away and leave the world and the church in a worse condition than before. So when these churches refused to accept the first and second angels' messages as they were being given, they were in, under delusions because who pushed forward the first and second angels? It was people who were giving it, but it was pushed forward. It was constrained by the Holy Spirit. And so when, you, when those churches rejected the Holy Spirit, they had to fall by default under, under strong delusions. That makes sense? Do that make sense? Amen. Are you sure? Amen. Okay. As the churches refused to receive the first angel's message, they rejected the light from heaven and fell from the favor of God. They trusted to their own strength and by opposing the first message, placed themselves where they could not see the light of the second messages, but the beloved of God who were oppressed, accepted the message, Babylon is fallen and left those churches. Question, I've already given the answers, but what churches did they leave? The nominal churches. So back in 1776, I explained this a little bit earlier, back in 1776, this second beast comes up as a lamb. But as we move, as it moves along time, that lamb or that, those churches within that nation become apostate Protestantism. And then in, by 1843, that lamb is now, under the, under the delusions of Satan, speaking as a dragon. Did that, is that not how it happened? Amen. That's how it happened. By 1843, because they were rejecting God, they fell into strong delusions, and so now they were doing the work of Satan. I'm not going to do too many more quotes of Sister White's, but I wanted to bring this into, into line so you can follow the time frame. 1843 was when the first angel's message was given. 1844 was when the second angel's message was given, and she says, the second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844, and it then had a more direct application to the churches of the United States, where the warning of the judgment had been most widely proclaimed and most generally rejected. Most widely proclaimed and generally rejected. By who? By the fallen apostate Protestant churches. And when the decline, declension or declining in the churches had been most rapid, but the message of the second angel did not reach its complete fulfillment in 1844. That's why we're going to have that, that angel in Revelation 18 to come and give it more power because it didn't complete the work in 1844. And that angel from, eight, from Revelation 18 is going to come and the earth will be lighted with its glory because it's going to need more power because it's now going to go across the whole world and the whole world would have come to the point where they've heard the message. The churches then experienced a moral fall. 
in consequence of their refusal of the light of the Advent message. But that fall was not complete. As they have continued to reject the special truth for this time, they have fallen lower and lower. Not yet, however, can it be said that Babylon is fallen because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She had not yet made, she has not yet made all nations do this. The spirit of world conforming and indifference to the testing truth for our time exists and has been gaining ground in churches of the Protestant faith in all the countries of Christendom. And these churches are included in the solemn and terrible denunciation of the second angel. But the work of apostasy has not yet reached its culmination. If you look at this world today, you have to say, well, if we're not there, we're right on the very cusp of it. Amen? She says, near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun, and I heard the voice of, of the angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet them. And so when we have the first and the second angel's messages, only those who could go out to meet him were those who followed Jesus by faith through the first angel's message, through the second angel's message, and in preparation for the third angel's message. This is the last slide I think I'm going to have for you on her quote. Many saw the perfect chain of truth in the angel's messages and gladly received them in their order and followed Jesus by faith in the heavenly sanctuary. These messages, she says, were represented to me, what? As an anchor, As an anchor to the people of God. The three angels' messages are the anchor to settle us in the truth. Those who understand and receive them will be kept from being swept away by the many delusions of Satan. So there's the, there's, there's the other side of the coin. Those who reject it, they became delusional. Those who receive it will, will be anchored into the truth. They will be anchored into the truth. Turn with me to Revelation 13, 16, excuse me, Revelation 16, 13, and 14. Revelation 16, 13, and 14. Revelation 16, 13, and 14. You there? Say amen. amen. All right. John is talking, and this is, this is during the time of the plagues, and he's given a preview or telling us what we can expect to see happening. And I saw three unclean spirits, delusional spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, Lucifer, out of the mouth of the beast. Who's the beast? The papacy. And out of the mouth of the false prophet. We know who the false prophet is, right? If you don't, you will know today. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Satan works through all that will, that will lay down their connection with God. And so what Satan is going, to have, is going to cause these spirits to enter into anyone who rejects God. The papacy being a beast, being the beast in this, in this line of scripture, that those spirits enter into the, have entered into the papacy. But then those spirits are also found in the false prophet. And all three of these are working together to manifest spirits and these spirit, manifest, excuse me, miracles, and these miracles go where? To the, to the kings. What are the kings? Okay, we already said beasts are kings, and today kings are known mostly as what? Leaders. Leaders, right? Whether it's a prime minister, whether it's a president, even at the state and local level, level whether it's a governor or mayor, Anyone who does not receive the truth, these evil spirits will go forth and will also go forth where? To the whole world to, the whole world to do what? Yes. So the objective of the dragon, of the beast, and the false prophet, even though only one of them really knows, only one of those three really knows the objective, and that's Satan. Satan is trying to gather the whole world together. The, the beast, the papacy doesn't think that they're working for Satan. And the image definitely does not, does not think it's working for Satan. And the people who fall under the influences do not think that they're working for Satan. But the Bible says to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And their battle will have the rest of the world against God and his people.
Turn with me to Revelation 13 and 15. I'm just, that's Revelation 13 and 15. No, I didn't, I didn't talk about that. Revelation 13 and 15. Turn with me to Revelation 13 and 15. Are we there? This is going to seem like part review, but it's not. It's going to lead into what we're talking to. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Those who've been here for Wednesday night know exactly what this is all about. Who had power to give life unto the image of the beast? Come on. Go back to Revelation 13, 11. Go back to Revelation 13, 11. I'm going to lock the doors. Go back to Revelation 13, 11. Okay, who is, who, is the, who is the character, who is the character in Revelation 13, 11? You better get to know this. Okay, you better get to know this. It's the U.S. is under the control of the fallen apostate Protestant evangelical churches. Okay? Do you get that? It's the second beast. Right? So we say, or the Bible says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. This collection, this apostate churches and an apostate nation, they come together and they have power to, to give life unto the image. What is another word for an image? Replica, reflection. So the United States and its, the, the civil powers in the United States and the religious powers in the United States come together to give power to the image or the reflection of the first beast. So apostate Protestantism works to duplicate or replicate what the first beast has done. And in doing that, it, they, they make it so that the image should both what? Speak. Another word for speak is legislate and cause through their legislation that as many that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Psalms 94, 20 and 21. OK. Framing mischief as a law, framing mischief as a law. So we see here that the image right here, the image right here. Which, really is, which is really the evangelical churches are going to give life to the beast. In other words, what did the beast do during the Dark Ages? It persecuted and prosecuted, right? It killed people. But it, it's not doing it anymore. It's not doing it now, is it? But eventually, when church and state in the United States have gotten strong enough, they are going to do the same thing. They're going to persecute and prosecute those who will not keep Sunday. Okay? Let's look at this. Let's see if what I'm saying is right. Okay, let's see if what I'm saying is right. Sister White says, the investing, the church, excuse me, this investing, the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. You get that? You get that? This investing, the church, or allowing the church to have this power of the state. Remember, remember, the papacy had no military power, did it? It never had military power, but it sure enough used military power, didn't it? So when a, when a church uses the state to exert power against someone, it's doing the very same thing that the papacy is doing, has done. The investing the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. Men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. She wrote this in 1899, 121 years ago. They have invested their strength in politics and have united with the papacy. So on one hand, they're united with the state and on another hand, they have the papacy telling them how to do what they're doing. But you don't see their hand connected to the papacy, and many of us don't see that their hands connected to the state. 
We turn a blind eye and say, oh, they're not going to do anything. They've been working on this for a long time, brothers and sisters. But the time will come when God will punish those who have made void his law and their evil work will recall upon themselves. So let's take it from 1899 to 2016. Let's see if what I'm saying, I'm going to say it. Let's take it from 1899 to 2016. Let's see if this is true. Now, I hope I got my sound. I would like to thank the evangelical and religious community because I'll tell you what, the support that they've given me, and I'm not sure I totally deserve it, <laughs> has been so amazing and has had such a big reason for me being here tonight. True. So true. They have much to contribute to our politics, yet our laws prevent you from speaking your minds from your own pulpits. An amendment pushed by Lyndon Johnson many years ago threatens religious institutions with a loss of their tax-exempt status if they openly advocate their political views. Their voice has been taken away. I am going to work very hard to repeal that language and to protect free speech for all Americans. Now, some will say, well, wait a minute, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with churches being able to speak from the pulpit? Many people will say that, right? Is it right for churches to speak from the pulpit about religious issues? Don't be scared. You're all wrong. Um, excuse me, I said, right. Religious issues, right. How about politics, political issues? Ooh, sister, sister Villard looked like she was ready to come all the way down here upon me. She was very serious about that. And the prophet says, those who teach the Bible in our churches and our schools are not at liberty to unite in making apparent their prejudices for or against political men or measures, because by doing so, they stir up the minds of others leading each to advocate his favorite theory. There are among those professing to believe present truth, some who will thus be stirred up to express their sentiments and political preferences so that division will be brought into the church. Now, that's what she says, but let's, let's break it down so we understand what that really means. When you advocate your political position, plus or minus, then what you've done is you've said that God can't do this for me, therefore I need the government to do it for me. And what did Jesus say? Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar. Render un what was he saying when he said render to Caesar that which is Caesar, render unto God? What was he saying? They should be separate, but what did you say, Sister Jesse? Your taxes, that's the only thing you're responsible for in Caesar's arena. That's the only thing. Otherwise, Paul tells us, Paul tells us, you are ambassadors from heaven. Amen. Amen? Now, if I was the ambassador from the United States to, let's say, Brazil, when I go to Brazil, do I participate in their political arena? No. Are you sure? No. You do not. That's exactly right. Because I'm not trying to become a Brazilian, am I? I? I am representing the US government as the ambassador to Brazil. You are ambassadors from heaven. And as a result, as an ambassador from heaven, you don't represent America. You represent heaven. And so to put your opinions into what's going on to Amer in America, it distracts people from your relationship with God and makes them feel that you have a dog in the fight. I see you, Raymond, and I see Sister, Sister Villard. Okay, go ahead, Brother Raymond.
Absolutely. Absolutely. Here's the statement. Those who teach the Bible in our churches and out in our schools are not at liberty to unite in making apparent their prejudices for or against political what? Men. We stay out of the politics that apply to men. There are certain legislations that we can vote for because it could, mean a, it could mean a school in our community, it could mean a hospital in our community, or something like that. But men, you don't know what a man's going to do. You have no idea what's in his heart. And for that matter, or for that reason, our objective is to remain ambassadors and render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and render unto God that which is God. And so when we look at this, the prophet tells us, she says, an apostate church will unite with the powers of earth and hell to place upon the forehead or in the hand the mark of the beast and prevail upon the children of God to worship the beast and his image. And they will tell you that is not our objective. They will tell you we are not trying to do that. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you, once you have the power of the government, the papacy probably never thought that they would do the Inquisition early on. But when they realized that they had that power and people would not bring in their tithes and offering to the church, they said, you better come to church. And if you had a home church and a new person showed up at your home church, more, more often than not, that new person was a spy going back to the, the priest to report on you, and next thing you know, you or the people in your home church were being put, taken to the Inquisition because the, the, because the civil authority was backing the church. And when you give a church that kind of power, what do they say about power? Power corrupts, and absolute power does what? Corrupts absolutely. And so as the prophet says, they will seek to compel them to renounce their allegiance to God, to God's law, and yield homage to the papacy. Now, they will say it's not homage to the papacy. And in, in, in essence, looking on the outside, it doesn't look like homage to the papacy. But the mark of the beast is homage to who? The papacy. The beast is the, the, beast is the papacy, right? The mark of the beast is the mark of the papacy. And so she says they will seek to compel them to renounce their allegiance to God and yield homage to the papacy, which is the mark of the beast. Then will come the times which will try men's souls for the confederacy of apostasy, apostasy will demand that the loyal subjects of God shall renounce the law of Jehovah and repudiate the truth of his word. Now, again... We hit study this week. We hit study this week, and I'm just going to share this one quick little thing with you. We're going to move on because I, I only got a half an hour left. There are three branches of government, right? Three branches of government. Which one is the most is, is the most powerful? I hear some saying, "What's come on? Which one is the most powerful?" Legislation. Where do we see that in scripture? Where do we see that in scripture? The most powerful branch of government. Come on, you folks. We're going over this over and over again. Revelation 13 and 11. The most powerful branch of the United States government. And I beheld another beast coming up out of this earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake. How do nations speak? by their legislative division, legislative arm, the legislative branch. And so the power in this country lies with the Congress. But everybody gets riled up when you start talking about the presidency, don't they? They get all riled up. But the president does not create laws. All he does is signs laws, amen? But because people spend so much time worrying about a figurehead who has four or maybe eight years to serve, they lose sight of those people who get no less than two 
but as much as a lifetime to serve. Am I not right? A, a, a House of Representative member gets a, gets a term of two years, but he can run over and over and over again, right? A senator, he gets six years, but he can run over and over and over again. Am I right? But the president, he gets how long? He can't even come back and run for re-election, even after he's won eight years. No matter how much the people like him, he cannot run again. And so the power, according to scripture and according to the Constitution of the United States, in this nation lies with the Congress. And if the, if the power in this nation lies with the Congress, why do we spend so much time worrying about what the president does? You know why? Because our, our psyche has been turned in that direction. The truth of the matter is, whoever controls the Congress controls the direction of this country. That's the truth. Whoever controls the Congress of this nation controls this country because a president can come and go. If you have a particular agenda item that you want to have signed into law, you got to get someone to have it, what? Lobby for a law before it can get to the president to sign off. He can't make any law. He can try executive orders, but another president can come behind that president and do another executive order. Is that not true? Yeah. All right. Let's see. Let's watch something. Now, this is going to get very serious, brothers and sisters. This is getting ready to get very serious now. This is where you're going to, you're going to get some lumps in your stomach because I'm going to show you some things that most people don't even realize are going on. All right, watch this. To the white evangelicals who listen to what Jim said, and they say, Jesus is in my heart and my head, right. but Donald Trump is doing the practical work that we want. Under President Trump, nine states have passed restrictive abortion laws. Right. For those white evangelicals, that's the whole thing. It's part of the whole thing. <clears throat> I think that's. I think that's right. Um, I think what they would say, white evangelicals who support Trump, is that they would say that he advances policies that they think advance the common good, the moral good. I think that where they are really vulnerable uh, isn't that they might vote for him, although I think that would be a huge mistake. It's several things. It's number one, that they just won't speak truth to power. They won't say, look, we agree with your judges, but what you're doing is immoral. Uh, it is illegal. It is dehumanizing people. It's cruel and it's crude. So that idea of, of speaking truth to power, they can't do. The second thing is, um, and this is the most painful thing probably of the Trump era for me because I'm a, a, a person of the Christian faith as well, is the subordination of faith to politics. That is, rather than looking at faith as a prism through which to identify the, the moral ethic for your politics, it's flipped around. In that poll that you cited, almost half of the white evangelicals say that there is virtually nothing that Donald Trump can do um, that would cause them to lose support. And I will tell you, just from personal experience, I've had these conversations with fairly prominent white evangelicals, mm -hmm. and I've pushed them. And I said, what's the limiting principle for you? What exactly would Donald Trump have to do to forfeit your vote, not even to earn the vote of a, of a Democrat? And the answer that I get is none. That is, that they, they're so seized with fear, that uh, many of them, not all evangelicals, but many of them, so seized with fear and a sense that this is an existential moment, that they believe that they have to defend Trump no matter what he does because they think darkness will descend upon the land if he loses. That's the mindset you're, that we're dealing with. Okay, but then doesn't that get us somewhere, Jim, around the worshiping of false idols? Well, Pete is, is right. I mean, here's, here's a radical idea. Our faith should shape our politics, not the other way around. So some of these religious right, uh, evangelical white elite leaders, they've made a Faustian bargain, as Pete's been describing here, a Faustian bargain with Donald Trump. You give us these things we want and we'll ignore everything you say and do. So this is the body of Christ around the world, the church, is the most diverse human community on the planet. But here, it is idols, Stephanie, you're right. It is the idols of uh, uh, whiteness and, and the whole, our neighbor is our enemy. No, Jesus said, love your neighbor. So there's an idolatry here, and you're right on it. That's what we have to deal with. This is about our relationship to God. 
I just want to add one thing, and, and I think it's an important caveat to this. It's not simply what Donald Trump is doing in policy. There's something, I think, even more pernicious going on. There's a lot of white evangelicals see his style, the way he conducts himself, and there's mm -hmm. actually a psychic satisfaction out of that. They feel like he's giving voice to their grievances and their resentments, and that he's going to bring a, a gun to a cultural knife fight, and that delights a lot of them, I'm, I'm afraid to say. There are two things I want you to get from that statement, from right there. The gentleman on, the, on, the, on your right says they are so seized with fear. He said, they're so seized with fear. Write that on your tabletop. That darkness will come on the earth, will, will descend on the earth. The other one said they've made a Faustian bargain. Okay, I want you to remember those two things because this is extremely important. A Faustian bargain, and without regard to the future costs or consequences. If white evangelicals are going to a politician to do for them that which Christ can do for them, what does that make them? Apostate. I mean, because if a woman is married to a man, and, she, and, and they come up on hard times, and she, he doesn't know, but she goes and goes to another man and asks him to help her out, then she's become an apostate, right? She's become an adulteress, OK? Now, I want you to understand something. I want you to understand something. They said, with, um, the gentleman on the, no, she said that th there's an issue here with judges, right? There's an issue here with trying to get, or they've gotten a certain amount of judges. What are you, why would you be trying to stack the deck with so many judges in your favor unless you were going to, you knew that a time was coming that the laws are going to be what? Tested, Amen. What, is the, what does this branch of the government do? They determine, the judicial branch of the, of the government, of the, of the um, government, yes, determine the what? Constitutionality of an enforced law. So in other words, if your judges are, are leaning in your direction, they're going to lean in your direction regardless of what's right or wrong. That's just how it is. Because the decisions that they are making are not decisions based on Protestant, the Protestant religion. They're based on a skewed view of religion. And we're going to see that in just a second. I'm, I know this is, this is quite a bit, so you just have to bear with me. But would you say go back? OK, which one was I on? So the judicial branch, if you can gain control of the legislative branch, and the judicial branch, the executive branch, doesn't really mean much of anything. All he can do is nominate judges. But it's the, it's the legislative branch who's going to approve those judges. And you get, the right ju you get the right executive, you're going to get the right judicial, and you will have control the entire government. You got it, Sister Jordan? Sister Jordan, did you get it? OK. Sister White says, but what is the image of the, to the beast? And how is it to be formed? The image is made by the who? Two horned beasts, Revelation 13, 11 through 18, and is an image to the first beast, Revelation 1, 13, 1 through 10. It is also called an image of the beast. Then to learn what the image is like and how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. So we need to look at the papacy not in terms of saying the papacy is going to do this or the papacy is going to do that. That is not what our objective is. Our objective has to be to see what the papacy has done historically and see what's happening with the image. And when we see the image do something like the papacy did, we know we're getting closer and closer to execution, full execution, to where the image is going to cause as many as who would not worship the beast to be killed. And so you test the waters. You test to see how far you can push the envelope. And you keep pushing the envelope. And once you realize that you have gotten all this power, then you will cause as many as would not worship the mark of the beast to be killed. That is how it works. They're not going to do it all in one fell swoop. And anyway, God is going to hold it back until we get our acts together anyway, or at least until somebody gets their act together. 
when the early church, speaking of the papacy, became corrupt by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God, and in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. Back during 1843 and 1844, the same thing happened with the fallen apostate Protestant churches. Read that sentence again. When the early church, she's talking about the Catholic church, Apply that to 1843 with the fallen apostate Protestant churches and see if it doesn't ring true. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit. Did the fallen apostate Protestant churches lose the spirit of Christ? That's why they were left in the holy place as that small group of people moved to the most holy place. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. That's where we are right now. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. We are so very close, very close. Here's a pastor who just recently left the evangelical churches. And I mean very recently source of support for President Trump comes from the white evangelical community of Christians. Reverend Robert Schenck is a clergyman from that very group. And after some deep self-reflection, he changed his mind on some of the so-called culture war issues and regrets his often divisive rhetoric at the time. He now leads an educational nonprofit which takes inspiration from the anti-Nazi dissident Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was executed for plotting against Hitler. Here he is now talking to our Michelle Martin about embracing empathy in these turbulent times. You, along with Pat Robertson, are one of the very few white evangelicals to criticize the president for this at a time when there's obviously great unhappiness, anxiety, and grief uh, in the country. Why do you think that is? I think first it points to the moral collapse in my own religious community. Among my fellows, uh, there was a Faustian deal made with Donald Trump, which went something like this. Uh, Donald Trump promised, I will give you everything you've ever wanted on your laundry list of political deliverables if you give me what I want and demand, and that is religious cover. I need you to say that I'm blessed of God and that everything I've done is good. He defended the photo uh, in front of St. John's Church with the Bible by saying a lot of Christians think it's a great photo. And that's what he needs in the deal. And we made that deal with him. And uh, so there's a moral vacuum. There's an inability to muster the moral courage to stand up to this. I was delighted to see what Pat Robertson said, the fact that he did speak out was terribly important, though a little late in the game, uh, but he did. But my other colleagues uh, have not been able to do that for a number of reasons. One is because they would be assailed by their own constituents now for doing so. But the other is they would lose access, instant access. They know that Donald Trump will throw them under the bus, will lock them out of the White House, will uh, insult them and disown them in an instant if they displease him. They are aware of that. And so they have to play uh, this game very, very carefully. They're on very thin ice. They want uh, what they still have outstanding on the list, which is a final appointment to the Supreme Court to give them a, a rock solid conservative majority. They're not gonna let anything endanger that, even this kind of supremely offensive behavior. We keep hearing, particularly from political figures, that privately the conversations are different. Um, I don't know how much credence to give to that because the fact of the matter is if you are a public figure, your public utterances are your record. 
But I do wonder what kinds of conversations that you have with fellow evangelicals, because quite in, in public, the support is as strong as ever. I mean, you know, Ralph Reed, who's kind of taken over the mantle of the, 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 uh, the moral majority, as it were, the, sort of the politically most active evangelicals, particularly white evangelicals, social conservatives, you know, very strongly defending it. I was just sort of curious about that. Their support has been as strong publicly as ever. Are the conversations privately different? Well, you know, a year, two years ago, I used to hear my colleagues, they would whisper, you know, I know the guy's way over the top. I know he's terribly offensive. I know he's way too visceral. Uh, he's too impulsive. He doesn't know us. He's not religious. Look, we know who he is. He's a secularist. He's not a believer, but he's good for us. And who else is going to get this done? And it's going to take a fighter like him to get it done. Now I don't hear that much anymore. And that, that's even more distressing to me mm. because what it seems to suggest is that a kind of final conversion has taken place, at least in their thinking, if not in their hearts. And if it is in their hearts, then I, 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 I fear for them. I mean, in one sense, just in terms of reclaiming their moral integrity, uh, regaining a sense of ethics and what is right and wrong. And if, that, if they have lost that ability to discern that, then they are indeed in very grave danger personally certainly as a community. I mean, we know what the history of demoralized churches are. Uh, they quickly become relics of history and not good ones. Uh, and then, of course, there's, I'm still a believer in salvation. I think we have to have a certain standing before God. And if we lose that, we've lost everything. The Bible even reminds us of that. It says, what does it profit a man? if he gained the whole world, but lose his soul. That's the ultimate law. Now remember, he said, there are a number of things. I, I want to talk about this Faustian bargain, but I want to also talk about him saying that there is one more Supreme Court justice that they're trying to get. Did you hear him say that? They're holding out for one more Supreme Court justice, right? Did y'all hear that? Are you awake? Are you still with me? Okay. Do you know that just, uh, this is what the Supreme, Court just, the Supreme Court looks like now. Now one would look at that and say six Roman Catholics and three Jews, that's a slam dunk, right? But as Brother Raymond said this morning in, in, in Sabbath school, you, you know, men may try to do something, but God can compel them to do something else. Everyone thought that when they had a, they had a Supreme Court uh, majority of, of six, that no matter what, and at least five would be conservatives, they always were going to go in, in the favor of the right side, amen? They always thought that. But John Alito, um, excuse me, John Roberts, John Roberts, who was Jesuit trained, has become more of the swing vote than they would have expected. And so now he's being characterized as not really being conservative. But no, he's, what's going on is, I believe, like Brother Raymond says, the Lord is working on his heart. His decisions are not just slam dunk always to the right. So what we see here is, when you look at the Supreme Court, they need to have five always going to vote for the conservative side. Always going to vote for the religious right. And so John Roberts has become a question mark. And we have right now, as of yesterday, Ginsburg, who's now in the hospital with her fifth bout of, ca of cancer. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg battling cancer again. So what we're seeing here, brothers and sisters, is this election, whichever way it goes, whichever way it goes, it's going to be one that's going to push us into a vortex. This is going to push God's people in the vortex and what's going to ultimately happen, brothers and sisters, is we're going to see what a real, we're going to see what a real relationship the evangelicals have 
with our government. So what is a Faustian bargain? What is a Faustian bargain, as I begin to wrap up? Who was Faust? First, we must answer that. Faust was the protagonist of a classic German legend. Based on the historical Johann Hohe Faust, the erudite Faust is highly successful, yet dissatisfied with his life, which leads him to make a pact with the devil at a crossroads, exchanging his soul for unlimited knowledge and worldly pleasures. The Faust legend has been the basis for many literary, artistic, cinematic, and musical works that have reinterpreted it through the ages. Faust and the, object and the adjective Faustian imply a situation in which an ambitious person surrenders moral integrity in order to achieve power and success for a limited term. The Faust of early books, as well as the ballads, dramas, movies, and puppet plays which grew out of them is irrevocably damned because he prefers human to divine knowledge. He laid the holy scriptures behind the door and under the bench, refused to be called doctor of theology, but preferred to be styled doctor of medicine. So what is a Faustian bargain? As we wrap up, a Faustian bargain is a pact whereby a person trades something of supreme moral or spiritual importance such as personal values or the soul for some worldly or material benefit, such as knowledge, power, or riches. The term refers to the legend of Faust, or Faustus, or Dr. Faustus, a character in German folklore and literature who agrees to surrender his soul to an evil spirit in some treatments, Mephistopheles, or Mephiso, a representative of Satan. Again, excuse me, after a certain period of time in exchange for otherwise unattainable knowledge and magical powers that give him access to all the world's pleasures. A Faustian bargain is made with a power that the bargainer recognizes as evil or immoral. Didn't they say that they realized he wasn't, he was, he wasn't like them? Faustian bargains are by their nature tragic or self-defeating for the person who makes them because, because what is surrendered is ultimately far more valuable than what is obtained. Whether or not the bargainer appreciates that fact. Now, an image to the beast, a Faustian bargain, is something that the fallen apostate Protestant churches have entered into according to those evangelicals have spoken, right? Let's go back, let's rewind the tape a little bit and find out if there is a, another, another example of a Faustian bargain anywhere in history. Or has Rome ever signed or gone into a Faustian bargain in the past? I take your attention to what is called a concordat. Anyone ever heard of a concordat? Some have. A concordat, an agreement or treaty, especially one between the Vatican and a secular government, the Vatican is a what? It's a what? It's a church. So here's an agreement between a church and a state. Of, and what did the evangelicals do? They are a church, and they've made a bargain with the state relating to matters of mutual interest. Now, I show you here one of the most famous and more recent people who really used a Faustian bargain, or excuse me, a concordat, was Pope Pius XII. And he was the pope during World War II. He was known, he's, a book was written about him by a gentleman named John Cornwell, a Roman Catholic, and the book is called Hitler's Pope. Another book was written by a man named Dr. L.A. Lehman, and what he has here is, on the cover of the book, it says, Behind the Dictators. And he's showing that during World War II, it was Pius XII who was behind Hitler, who was behind Husha, Husha, Harishimoto, the emperor of J Japan, Mussolini, and Franco. He controlled all four of those dictators through a concordat. A concordat is a convention between the Holy See and a sovereign state that defines the relationship between the Catholic Church and the state in matters that concern both. For instance, the recognition 
and privileges of the Catholic Church in a particular country and with secular matters that impact on church interests. That is the, no different than a Faustian agreement or bargain. According to P.W. Brown, the use of the term concordat does not appear until the pontificate of Pope Martin V in a work by Nicholas de Cusa entitled De Concordatia Catholica. The first concordat dates, dates back from 10, 1098, and from then to the beginning of the First World War, the Holy See signed 74 concordats. A concordat is a relationship between a nation and the papacy, so there are at least as of World War II, 74 countries that have a concordat with the Roman Catholic Church. Due to the substantial remapping of Europe that took place after the war, new concordats with legal successor states were necessary. The post-World War I era saw the greatest prolifer proliferation of concordats in history. Although for a time after the Second Vatican, Vatican Council, which ended in 1965, the term concordat was dropped. It reappeared with the Polish concordat in 1993 and the Portuguese concordat of 2004. So they're still writing them. A different model of relations between the Vatican and various states is still evolving in the wake of the Second Vatican Council's declaration on religious liberty. How do you like that? And so a concordat is no different than a Faustian bargain between a civil institution and a religious institution. The only difference being is the evangelicals or the fallen apostate Protestant churches have done it with the House of Representatives or Congress, the White House, and the Supreme Court. They control all three branches, but who's behind them? It's still the same, because remember, the dragon gave the beast its power, and the beast allowed its power to move over to the United States. My last two slides, I'm almost finishing right on time. A.T. Jones addressing this same situation and admonishing the people of God on being careful not to enter into these kind of rela relationships in General Conference, Daily Bulletin, one, uh, 147, 1893, he says, we have found that nothing will satisfy us, nothing will do for us but the character of God. We have found in the matter of means and business affairs so far as this world is concerned that we cannot depend upon any of, the, any of these anymore, but only upon the things that God gives. So when someone says to you to enter in, into any agreement Whatever that agreement is, that is not a, a, an agreement that includes the Lord, what are you supposed to do? Go the other direction, amen? We have found that as to life itself, we cannot count on that anymore. The only thing that will satisfy, the only thing that we can depend upon, the only thing that will meet our demand, the demand of the people who will now stand for the Lord, is that life that is better than this one, that life that is eternal. The evangelicals have gone to depend upon the civil government. The Roman Catholic system grew to depend upon the civil government. And we're seeing it happen right now in our church. I don't want to show you because I don't want to get in trouble. But you know, you ever heard the term PPP recently? The money that the people who got the small businesses received from the government as stimulus, the PPP, what is it, what, what is it called? Stimulus. It's the stimulus money, but it's the, it's the abbreviation for the stimulus money that went to small businesses called PPP. I forget what the name of it, I forget what the name of it is, but it's money that small businesses got from the government during the stimulus package. Uh, all, any company and every company who wanted it, if they were small enough, could apply for it. You're familiar with that, right? Did you know that there's a list of all the Seventh-day Adventist churches that received that money too? Did you know that? I can show you the list. I didn't want to put it up here. Sister, Sister Darlene is going to find it. 
Say it again. It's Paycheck Protection Program. And there are Seventh-day Adventists, individual churches, as well as Paycheck Protection Program. And there are individual Seventh-day Adventist churches, individual Seventh-day Adventist conferences, unions, and divisions who have all gotten part of that money. No less than $1 million. No less than $1 million. So what we're seeing here, brothers, right, brothers and sisters, right now is because it's free money from the government, people are saying, I'm going to get my share. But we see here, brothers and sisters, nothing is free, at least in America. I, do I, have, no, I don't have it on the spot, but I can actually send you a copy of it. I can send you from, that from here. There's going to come a time, brothers and sisters, when we're going to have to, prov we're going to, have to prove that we are going to stay, stick with God and not veer away. No matter how broke we may seem to be, no matter how the lights may be off, the EMP, the, electronic, the ele electromagnetic pulse may shut off our solar. But brothers and sisters, we're going to have to depend upon Lord, the Lord. And Jones continues, says, when that time comes, I propose to tell them just what to do. I propose to set before them, anybody who's like us, just what I have set before you, that if they are going to oppose, if we are going to oppose this church and state movement, they and us have got to set aside all ideas of earthly dependence. All ideas of earthly dependence. They have got to set aside all thoughts of riches or possessions or anything of that kind and all ideas or thoughts of life. Whoa. And they can see it. And then I shall tell them they cannot afford to do that unless they get something better. And the thing better is Jesus Christ. And they must have him or else they cannot stand at all. My brethren, the world is ready to hear the message. When we get the message, the world is ready to hear it. And they will hear it. General Conference Daily Bulletin, 1893, February 5th, page 147. And so here we are right now. That rock that rock that Nebuchadnezzar saw is getting ready to hit the feet of that image. Where are you hidden? Where are you hidden? Are you in that image or are you hidden in that rock? We want to be hidden in that rock, but as long as we have possessions of the world, we are in that image. As long as the world has ties to us, we are there. We are in the world. Our earthly possessions should mean nothing. And acquiring more earthly possessions should be even less than that. Especially when acquiring earthly possessions mean we have to get it from the government. I'm not sitting here, I'm not standing here and telling people that are retired not to accept your social security. You put that in there. That's your money. But when you have to go and apply for something that all the rest of the world is applying for because it's a, it's a gimme, it's an extra, there's no gimmies, there's no extras, there's no free ride in this country. There is not. Either we are wrapped up in the third angel's message, which is the only thing that can save us from the image, the mark, the number, or his name. The only thing that can save us right now, brothers and sisters, is the third angel's message. That's the only thing. Unless we are wrapped up in the righteousness of Christ, what is the third angel's message? The righteousness of Christ in verity. We will be lost. We cannot depend on anything else. All the other churches, and even, I won't say that, all the other churches are wrapped up in the government in some way, shape, or form. Even if it's with the 501c3, you heard the president say he wanted to write down or mark down the 501c3 or the Johnson Amendment, but most churches are tied up in it. If we have faith in anything except for the life, the sacrifice and the work of Christ, we're going to fail. The evangelicals have traded their dependence in Christ and on Christ into a dependence on the government. Oh, that's just my words, Sister Susan. Those are just my words. I can't remember all this stuff. Sometimes I have to write it down. And that is the work. That is the very principle of the third angel's messages. Right, third angel's message righteousness by faith. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image 
and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the, of the Lamb. Verse 9 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast, the image, or receive the mark in his forehead, the only thing that can protect you from the beast, the image, the mark, or the number is the third angel's message because we see in verse 11 it says, And the smoke, this is the result, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the what? Faith of Jesus, righteousness by faith. The image to the beast, brothers and sisters, is right in front of us right now. They are doing everything they possibly can to push us into framing a law, mischief against the people of God. Whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even your faith. What we're seeing right now, brothers and sisters, is a church that has gone completely out of control. They have, they have unlimited power. They can do whatever they want because they have civil authority that they are saying, whatever you do is right. God gave Jesus to save the entire world. The evangelicals don't think that's enough. They think that they need the power of this earth, the powers on this earth, the kings of this earth. And so when we look at Revelation 16, we see that the dragon, the beast, and the image all depend upon the powers of this earth. But God loved Jesus, loved this earth so much that he sent Jesus to save us from all three of those powers. Brothers and sisters, if you don't know, if you think that the papacy is going to do this, you're fooling yourself. And if anyone tells you that it's going to be the papacy, you're fooling yourself. The work of the image, the mark, the number, the name, all fall on the backs of the evangelicals. And the evangelicals are going to be the ones who are going to bring this world to the very brink of a national Sunday law, not the papacy. Don't let anyone tell you that it's the papacy. The papacy will not come out from behind the scenes until the national Sunday law is in place. Then they will come out, and then there will be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. And I don't know about you, but I, my faith is even more secure as I've studied this about the evangelicals, because God said that the false prophet would be the one who would do this work. And I don't know about you, if it, even, if it seemed evil unto you to to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't know where we are right now. I don't know where you are. I know where I am. I know that, the, I know that every single sign on this planet is saying that these people have run out of control. The next time someone comes to you and says what the papacy is going to do, ask them, show it to you in scripture. If they can't, then it's not the papacy who's going to cause the image. It is the evangelicals. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are told that we, are not, we, are, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Peter tells us that. We follow Christ. We desire to follow Christ. And Christ said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Render unto God that which is God's. And sometimes the distractions of this world can be overwhelming. The deceptions can come in all forms and fashions. And we are told that in the past, trouble was nowhere near as bad as what we thought it would be. But this time, this time the calamities that are coming up on this earth, pen cannot write. Help us to be prepared 
and be hidden in Christ. Because not being hidden in Christ means that we will be destroyed when that rock cut out without hands hits the bottom of that, the feet, hits the feet of that image and destroys and brings all down to the threshing floor. Be with us the rest of this Sabbath day. Help us to go home and study and see where we are and see if these things are true. Let us be as the Bereans. We thank you so much for hearing our prayers and the answers that will come. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.